All right. Welcome, everyone, to our monthly lecture series on single cell omics. It's a great pleasure to have Celine Valo with us today. Um, she will give us a talk about her exciting work on mechanisms um, on cell plasticity in breast cancer with a focus on epigenetics. I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, before we start, uh, a few housekeeping rules and announcements of the next lectures. We will have um, three more lectures this year uh, in October, November, and December, and we will announce the speakers for those uh, very soon. So we'll keep you posted and uh, check our website. Uh, for today, after the 30-minute presentation by Celine, there will be time for questions and discussion. Uh, two options to do that, either uh, raise your hand to indicate that you would like to ask a question or also just post it um, in the chat and then we will read it out for you. Um, uh, before Celine starts, a few words uh, about herself and her work. Celine did her PhD at the Institute Curie and then a postdoc focusing on X chromosome inactivation. Um, after that, until today, she is a research scientist and group leader at uh, Institute Curie, working on the dynamics of epigenetic alterations and plasticity in breast cancer. Uh, she's also a um, scientific advisor and founder of One Bioscientist, which uses the power of single cell analyses to find new targets for a broad range of difficult to treat conditions. Celine is a pioneer in developing single cell chip seek protocols and is pushing the limits of um, single cell epigenetics, epigenomics, with uh, exciting research on early steps of tumor genesis and cancer treatment. So uh, we are very um, honored to have you here today. We are looking forward to your talk on the mechanisms of cell plasticity in breast cancer. So Celine, the stage is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Julia, for this introduction, and also Nina and, and others for the invitation. Uh, I almost feel at home at the ESCOG, uh, being twice to the meeting and, and now here. It's always a, a great pleasure. Um, so I'll share my slides. Just... Do you see my slides? Okay. Yes, looks good. Okay. So yeah, the, the idea today is uh, to tell you a, a bit about what we do in the lab currently. Um, so, and I'll tell you about some of the tools also we've developed in the past and are continue, continuing to develop now. Uh, but I'll try to focus uh, also during my talk on the story we have. So on transcriptomics, also about tumorigenesis, not only epigenomics. And uh, I hope you'll find that of, of interest for your research. So a bit of uh, introduction, uh, so I'm, I'm going to be quite fast because I think it's quite obvious to everyone here, but just to make the point why we're interested in chromatin modifications and other non-genetic features in cancer cells, uh, well, uh, always like this view of, of seeing normal development as a series of switches in cellular states, uh, of course, a simplified uh, view. Um, and here you can appreciate that uh, usually a cell is not going to uh, spontaneously uh, change its um, uh, phenotype, but it can, and this is determined by a certain amount of cellular uh, features, but also nuclear features, such as positive ones that are going to help the cell move on, uh, for example, if you have the proper transcription factor, or um, a, a nice set of uh, epigenomic remodelers or permissive chromatin marks throughout the genome at spots where it's uh, supposed to be, uh, the genes are supposed to get activated, well, that's going to help, right? And decrease the amount of energy that's needed uh, to fulfill uh, the switch. On the other hand, we know a series of these uh, repressive, either uh, chromatin or even epigenetic bound directly on DNA, such as DNA methylation, the garner prevents, and most of all, not only prevents switches during development, but also prevents mechanisms such as de-differentiation or trans-differentiation. And we've been pretty much interested in how all these factors contribute in the tumor evolution processes, um, and you'll see we work mostly on breast cancers. So just to say uh, in a nutshell that uh, it's been shown for a chromatin modification, but other types of epigenomic modifications that they can be moved around in uh, the genome of cancer cells. It can go in either direction, whether you accumulate um, repressive DNA methylation or histone modifications, and this can lead to the silencing of a series of genes, and this can be robustly transmitted to daughter cells really freezing the cell in a state of differentiation where it can only multiply, but not cannot, cannot differentiate. And this can really be a problem in some uh, situation. Uh, 
And the most one, one good example of this is EZDH2 activating uh, mutations. And I, as I was mentioning, this can also go the other way around, and, and some cells can lose uh, these uh, epigenomic marks. Um, this can be associated or not, and this we can discuss, to a reactivation of the genes that are supposed to lie in these uh, chromatin regions. Uh, but when it does lead to reactivation, here you see uh, uh, what we could call a, uh, decreasing these barriers because you don't have anything anymore that's going to prevent the activation of genes of the previous state or the subsequent state, making the cell highly plastic uh, for sure. Uh, but what I all, all always tend to say is I think we need to, to be careful and also in the era of multi-omics um, to keep in mind that looking at epigenomes, whether attack, um, cut and tag, any epigenomic marks, is not the same as looking at the transcriptome, and in particular, for example, when we integrate all these kind of things, <laughs> play around with the data, we need to keep in mind that they can be and they should be a decorrelation between those two data sets as well, because it's not at all the same to um, look at the transcriptome when you look at the proxy of what the cell is actually transcribing right now, whereas an epigenome is more about the potentiality of a cell. So there's not necessarily a full uh, correlation between the two phenomena. And you can, for example, lose repressive mark without activating gene expression. If you don't have the proper transcription factor, this is an easy uh, to get situation, right? So we need to, to get particularly interested in, in those cases. Anyway, uh, in the lab, what we do um, is to try to, to use this uh, quite fundamental knowledge of gene regulation um, at different epigenomic level to, to try to grasp a bit of what's happening in terms of tuber evolution. In, uh, we're mostly interested in triple negative breast cancer, which is an aggressive subtype of breast tumors but that's really not uh, the main focus here. What I want to say is that we're interested in understanding different dynamic kind of windows, both during the early steps of tumor formation, but also during a response uh, and subsequent escape to initial treatment. And clearly where we started uh, some years ago was can we first understand the heterogeneity of chromatin features? Because <laughs> we know what's happening in those uh, gray cells. And now can we move to a more dynamic view and appreciate the mechanism that drives this heterogeneity over time. And can we, for example, differentiate passengers from um, driver uh, non-genetic events and so on and so forth. Clearly you see that it's not only about fundamental understanding, it's about uh, um, really uh, trying to contribute to the translational understanding of these tumors, whether through therapeutic uh, leverage or innovation or the usage of epigenetic drugs in a longer term uh, manner. So if we go a bit back in time, uh, we uh, what do we care about epigenomic heterogeneity in breast cancer? Well, first, uh, I'm going to tell you what we did with it, but the, the idea was to start with a method, right? Um, and so we, we collaborated with uh, uh, the group of Andrew Griffiths uh, here in Paris, that's our microfluidic specialist, um, that helped us put together a method of single cell sheep seek. Um, this is kind of, of getting a, a bit older, right? But the idea is that you can nicely map, um, and especially, uh, I would stress that uh, heterochromatin features, so HPK27 methylation, we're now getting interested in K9. And the idea is, I think cheap is in particular, maybe if you think now a more cut and tag approach that we also do, I would think cheap is still a, a, a strong player in terms of heterochromatin appreciation. Uh, anyway, uh, this is the way it all started. This is about playing around with droplets. You can have a, have a look at our publication. It's about barcoding um, chromatin. And the idea behind that for us directly was to understand how could it serve our purpose of understanding tumor evolution, right? And what we were able to, to show, which now seems maybe a, a bit more simple, right, is to uncover the heterogeneity of a tumor. And can we understand anything about the different properties of the cells that are there? And thanks to this uh, repressive histone modification profiling at the single cell level, we were able to show that even if a tumor looks very homogeneous at the transcriptomic level, well, there can be uh, epigenetic subclones or epigenomic subclones, I would rather call them, uh, that would account for a bit less than 20% of the cells, with cells having a different repressive um, epigenetic landscape uh, with no associated changes in expression. And we thought this could be linked to resistance to, to treatment because these cells seem to be selected for upon treatment in our patient-derived xenograph models. So kind of the first example of how it can be important to look at the epigenome in a single cell manner in tumors, okay? But also, that it could also be important that it's not because you don't see anything at the transcriptomic level that there's not something starting to happen at the epigenomic level. 
So then we, we moved on more recently uh, to use this uh, single cell transcriptomic, but also epigenomic um, uh, technique. And I'll, I'll be just summarizing this because it, it's uh, all published. Um, the idea is now we went a bit further and said, okay, there's an interest in looking at these repressive epigenomes. Can we do that in a more um, systematic manner? And here we used, uh, like I just mentioned, patient-derived xenograft models. So it's about putting um, pieces of patient tumors on the back of these new mice and doing some avatars. You just treat these PDX models just as if it were a patient with different cycles of chemotherapy. And you can see that these tumors grow very fast. They initially respond to treatment exactly in patient, but they ultimately uh, recur. They come back again. So for us, it's a very convenient model to study um, in the lab uh, tumor evolution processes. And what we have done was to work a lot on the epigenome and the transcriptome of these cells and also with in vitro models as well and barcoding experiment. And what we've been able to do is to show that across patients, uh, the cells that are left over after treatment, so really the first signs of resistance to treatment, they always share the no same non-genetic features, uh, which are a basal signature for those who are aficionados of the mammary glands, <laughs> but they always have the same identity. And they always share the same remodeling of repressive stone modification. And in the most recurrent changes are loss of repressive stone modification at different EMT or TGF beta genes, uh, for example. And here, I, I, I want to sum up more in a kind of illustrative manner that this is what we found is in more detail is that at the molecular level, these uh, drug tolerance cells, what they are doing is that initially before treatment, they have bivalent chromatin, our genes are repressed, and upon treatment, they are losing K27 methylation and keeping this initial K4 to methylation to activate what we call a persistent or tolerant expression program that enables them to resist or tolerate at least the treatment. And for us, single cell there was kind of instrumental uh, to, to have access to those different chromatin states. But we also combine that with bulk approaches like rechip chip experiment to show the, the existence of these bivalent chromatin uh, molecules um, at the molecule level. Um, so I think it's always important uh, to, to not only do single cell, whatever it takes, but also to take a step back, right? And to try to combine to what we would call old fashioned, but not really, but other types of technique that are gonna tell you a lot also with higher resolution on what's happening at the molecular level. So once we had understood that the, the rational here uh, in those triple negative breast cancer uh, patient, what was happening in our models was a recurrent loss of repressive histone methylation at those bivalent promoters. Well, just to show you how close to the translational aspect this can be and how it fight, insightful it can be, we have tried to, to forbid that from happening. We have tried to stop the cells from demethylating these K27 residues. Can we stop that? And so we have naively used so far uh, histone demethylase inhibitors uh, targeting K27 and demethylase, um, the KDM uh, 6A and B. Uh, we have also done, they're not included in the paper, but we have also done knockouts of KDM 6A uh, that have exactly the same phenotypes as the one that are treated with histone demethylase inhibitors. And what happens is that in vivo, these are the mice that I just showed you that you don't give them anything or you give them the histone demethylase inhibitor. They couldn't care less. The tumor are not sensitive. These are the mice that are treated with chemotherapy. The, the real name is Xeloda, and this is what happens. They come back again. And when you do a co-treatment with the chemotherapy and the histone demethylase inhibitor, you delay uh, tumor recurrence. So we're, we're not curing entirely the, the mice, that's for sure. But what we think we might be doing is decreasing the pool of drug tolerant of persistent cells by really um, inhibiting histone demethylation. So it could be a way of, you know, having less of these cells if you forbid them from being plastic and removing actively um, histone modifications. Uh, it could be one way of hitting on them and increasing the initial response. So again, trying to push the, the point that understanding at the single cell level epigenomes, transcriptomes, uh, in, in this resistant case, I think is a highlight of how we can think about um, the timing of therapies, when to give epigenetic uh, therapies and so on. So just to tell you, because we are at the ESCOG about technologies where we are at now, uh, in addition to the chip, we have also um, implemented 
the Castillo Branco method on, on dual um, cut and tag because we're also interested in either bivalency in terms of poising and activating enhancers, but also on K27 methylation, K4 through methylation, I just talked about it. Can we study in the same single cells? Um, and we are now starting to map already the mammary gland in our mice and now in humans at single cell resolution, studying different marks. And I just want to show you an example of, I think, some of the surprises uh, we're going to get, um, even if you don't know the mammary gland. Wait, I'll just push that around. Even if you don't know the mammary gland, you'll understand what I'm saying. Here you see the different population that have been identified according to the enhancers that are enriched for either K4 or K27 acetylation. And this is the clustering algorithm. But what you can appreciate, for example, is that if you look at K27 acetylation, so active enhancers, the immune population looks like a homogeneous one population at this level of resolution. But looking at K4, it's much more informative. You have three different population of immune cells. And the other way is around is also true if you look at the luminal fully differentiated cells. So I think we're only starting to scratch the surface of what is cell identity and how does it correspond to different combination of epigenomes. Um, and if you see that in a normal situation, you can already dream or have nightmares about how complex it's going to be in a cancer situation, right? And this is what I'm trying to, to do is now have better maps with higher resolution, but also dual uh, enrichment to better understand the switch um, in cellular state. And, and this is currently uh, ongoing. But the, the, the full story I, I want to tell you um, in the second part um, is uh, this unpublished work from our, our lab um, on initiation of uh, tumor formation. And here you'll see it's a combination of work on the humans and in mice. So the big question, I think, uh, in the cancer field, uh, where whatever the tumor type is, how do these cells initially form? What does it take to become a tumor cell? And what are the different steps uh, that lead you there? So I just want to make it clear that in this context, uh, we've been focusing on, on people and mice with predisposition that have a BRCA1 deficiency. So they have a higher risk of getting breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer. So we know that looking at their tissue will be informative because it's going to happen at, at some point, right? So a little bit of background of why it's interesting to, 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 to look at epigenomes and non-genetic features in a, a breast cancer situation. If you, this is a mammary gland, if you want to have the vocabulary. And this is the normal differentiating uh, scheme. And you don't have to look at everything. But what I want to tell you is that in a normal gland, you have luminal cells and basal cells. So basal, the dark green, and the other are the luminal cells. But what's really striking is that those BRCA1 mutated cancer, they look like basal-like cancer. So they have features of basal-like cells but they come from luminal progenitors. People have shown that with very uh, fancy and elegant mice models. They have shown that very surprisingly, you cannot initiate this type of cancer from a basal progenitor. So meaning that you see where I'm getting there, there's a problem in cell identity there. You start from a luminal cell and you won't finish in a luminal cancer. No, you will finish in a triple negative or basal-like tumor. And this, I think for us, was the root of our interest is even if there's a lot of genetics that's involved for sure, there's something recurrent about how cell identity is changed and lost there that always leads to the same endpoint, starting from the same initial uh, cell of origin. So this being said, um, we have tried to, to think about how we could use single cell technologies um, to access pretumoral states in humans. I think that was that is still our mojo in the lab. <laughs> and if you think about the BRCA1 carrier, so a woman, who's born with uh, uh, one allele of the BRCA1 gene that's deficient. Um, she will almost in all cases get um, a breast or an ovarian cancer. And this, I, as, I, may, I put a scheme of the life of a mammary gland and she will get one. In some cases, she will get a tumor in the second breast and so on. And I think that most of the studies that were published recently or in the last years have focused on looking at the tissue of the women who get rid of their breast prior to getting any tumors. And you can appreciate that if you do that, you don't know at which point you are close to tumor initiation. So you can get lucky and be very close to tumor initiation and get uh, abnormal cells, or you can also be very far away. And in most studies, people haven't found a lot of abnormal epithelial cells because they might be far away from, from this, right? And this, if some of you are interested, uh, there's a, a series of papers also in 2023 that were published showing that there's no major deregulation of the epithelial compartment if you look at this part. 
So what we have tried to do um, is say, okay, we need to be close to the D-Day, right? To, to the day that this happens and still be in a normal situation. So we have worked with the pathologists from Institut Curie and in a retrospective manner, selected juxta tumoral, so tissue that looks absolutely normal in their eyes, nothing special, they've looked at it. It's close to the tumor, so it's close, it's an environment where some cells have managed to make it. So we think that the clock is right, the timing is correct. The challenge there is that this is done in a retrospective manner. So there's a pro, it's frozen uh, material and it's very small. Uh, it's less than a milligram of tissue. So it's very, very small biopsies. Um, it's not like the B surgical piece that you get from prophylactic surgeries or that you get from uh, surgeries post-treatment. So he, it was really a, a technical challenge. So we worked quite a lot on optimizing uh, single nuclear rna -seq to get data, I must admit, that's really of a coverage that looks close to what we can get in, in a fresh situation. And we also, uh, you can have a look, we have worked a lot on the embedding, embedding of this single nuclear RNA-seq, uh, not to push data integration because we were afraid that a slight perturbation we would see in the initial phases in those tissues would be completely uh, hidden by the integration step if we push it. So we have worked on an algorithm that we call Maya uh, that enables the generation of embedding without um, data integration. So we, we have got a series of, of patients with nuclei that uh, don't show that much of a batch effect here, you can see on the right. We get access to uh, really all, that's the nice thing about nuclei, right? You're not biased at all by the, 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 the propensity of a cell to get encapsulated on, on the 10X, and uh, the nuclei are more homogeneous in this matter. And we got even access to adipocytes that are only accessible through nuclei approaches, otherwise they, they don't get encapsulated in the 10X. So playing around with this data set, I will only show you what we've done on the epithelial compartments. So this uh, is the epithelial compartment in the, in the embedding. And here you see there's three populations. For those who don't know the mammary gland, there's three populations. There's two luminal um, population. Sorry, two luminal population. One that are luminal progenitors and one that are luminal differentiated cells. And they are the basal cells. And here, to our surprise, there were cells that were in between, uh, didn't know uh, what they were doing there. And you will see that these cells were only found in the BRCA1 patients. The bending is completely clear of these cells in BRCA1 wild type patients. So who are these cells? Uh, we've done hierarchical clustering on the, 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 the PCA that's behind the, this uh, UMAP. And we're able to identify this as this uh, cluster that's very close to luminal progenitor cells. It expresses almost all the markers of luminal progenitor cells uh, that you can see here on the right. But they also do some variation in some stress-related transcription factors like FOS. And you will see they have many more anomalies. So I think we were getting to a point that these cells, we cannot see them by the pathologist's eye, but they are starting to, to not lose, but starting to have a, a problem in their molecular signature. So as I was mentioning, these cells mostly come from BRCA1 mutated patients. You see that every compartment is affected by BRCA1 mutation. They do cluster per mutation, but as they still co-cluster in terms of identity, but there's a strong effect of the mutation that was expected, but I think it's nicely shown there. Um, and here you can clearly see that these cells that don't know where they, <laughs> they live, uh, they only come from these uh, BRCA1 patients. Interestingly, we have uh, modeled the level of copy number variation thanks to infer CNV. And we were able to observe that these cells are also the ones that are predicted to have the most um, uh, aberrant uh, copy number variations. And this is very significant if you look at the quantification on the right. So up to now, we've been able to say that we've identified a pool of cells that accumulate CNVs that are close to luminal progenitors. And something that I want to put on top of that uh, is that we have looked, and I don't have the heat map there, but we have looked at the intra-correlation, cell-cell correlation in each compartment. And this one is very poor. These cells look really, uh, don't look like one another, and they don't even look that much to, to luminal progenitors. So they're very heterogeneous. This is the average cell-cell correlation. Um, so what we're thinking is that there's many, there's an anomaly in the control of cell identity, um, and they are starting to do many different things, not yet homogeneous or clonally selected as we would see in a full grown tumor, but the tissue homeostasis is clearly starting to get a bit disrupted. So we were quite excited about this, but we knew that, well, this was only the starting, this is not a tumor because we don't see any tumors in these samples. So this might be a step further from what we usually understand, 
Meaning, uh, this could maybe, for example, be something we could think about if we take from patients regularly a single nuclei RNA seq and then quantify the amount of cells that have this disorder. Could be something that we could think of. But in terms of understanding what leads to a tumor, there's something missing, right? <laughs> these cells need to be pushed one step further. Um, so what we have done there was to combine our human study with um, a mouse uh, model that's uh, deficient for TP53 and BRCA1. And this for us, we think is a way of zooming up on the next step. First, because you have TP53 TP in addition to BRCA1 that's deficient. Plus, uh, you have many cells that are doing what we think we're doing in human is starting to have some CNVs. So this is how the model looks under the pathologist eye. For those who don't know, this is a normal gland in the mass, and this is starting to get a bit disorganized. You can appreciate that. It's not nicely arranged and getting to some very small um, carcinoma in situ or tumors and even bigger tumors later on. What we have been able to show with single cell data that we collected at, at 15 different groups was that as in humans, very early on, even if you don't have tumors, you start accumulating luminal progenitor cells with a copy number variation. So for us, it's a sign that this is a proper model. It can happen that you have copy number variation without any tumor. This we can discuss also. And you can tolerate the loss of TP53 and BRCA1 for at least three months without moving a notch and not doing a lot of things, right? So this is, I think, quite striking as well. So then we decided to see, okay, then what happens to these cells? How do they form these tumors once they have these CNVs? And this, I'll show you part of the data. Uh, this is single cell transcriptomics. Again, um, we can see here the different samples. These are the tumors, and these are cells that are uh, close to normal situation, and there's a continuum of states. Uh, you can see we isolated a lot of states in between tumors and normal cells. This is the annotation and the clustering. These are the luminal cells differentiated on progenitors, and these are basal. But what we can show is that with this serial sampling, we can identify a continuum of epithelial cells in between normal and tumor cells. And among the cluster, we found that it's unsupervised clustering with default resolution. We thought that the clusters that were the most interesting, so this is the one in between, is the one that has the higher uh, Shannon index with the contribution of the more samples we can get our hands on, whereas the ones that are sample specific for us are less of interest because they can be uh, my specific events of transformation. And we really got interested in these transitionary states that are multi-sample, composed of multi-sample. Here you can just have a view according to the time of the evolution uh, of these uh, different epithelial states uh, with time. So what I'll tell you is really, I think we, we, we hit uh, here something interesting with the identification of this pre cluster of cells that are present in uh, many, uh, in also animals without any tumors, some animals that start having carcinoma in situ, so pre-lesions and, and, and still present in some animals with tumors. So what are these cells? Um, uh, these cells, something that I didn't tell you is that if you do the PAG algorithm and try to, 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 to predict uh, what are the connection between the, the different states, um, what's really interesting is that you predict that the pre state is the only route or the only state by which you can reach the different tumor clusters that we identify in blue. If you want to go from a luminal progenitor cells and achieve full transformation, what we predict from the data is that you have to go through these pre states. And there are dead ends, like I just showed you. These are the monoclonal ones, so it really makes sense. This is indeed a dead end. <laughs> you never go through this state. What we don't really know is whether you need to be a luminal progenitor cells or what we call an alveolar cell, which is a different kind of luminal cells, to go through this uh, transition. So I think that this proof in terms, it's still only by informatics, but this proof um, of being the kind of the, the roots of every tumor state, I think it further pushes in in addition to the multiple sample or, or of origin, I think it pushes the signature in, in this mass model to clearly here we might have put our finger on something really interesting and in what it means to become a tumor cell if you have a lot of CNVs. So this is part of the signature. They are losing their luminal identity. Um, this we would suspect. I'm showing only part of the data. Uh, what I want to show you is the signature of these cells. They have a high deregulation of cell cycle with P16 and other cell cycle members being uh, deregulated. They are cycling even with this P16 activation. We've shown by immunohistochemistry that these cells are, are cycling. What we found was also very interesting. So we haven't pushed yet that far the MIC, but the second pathway that's enriched is epithelial to mesenchymal transition. 
So this might not be surprising to you, but it was to me because EMT is supposed to be involved in metastasis and how cells leave the tissue of origin or the tumor of origin to move to distant sites. While here it's involved in early, very early, early tumor formation. So for us, it was quite of a surprise and opening up our minds to the fact that maybe very early on in a transient manner, you will see there might be part of epithelial to mesenchymal transition that's needed to initially form the tumor and get out of these ducts probably. So I'll just show you in the few minutes I have left uh, the, the validation we've done of that. This is the EMT signature. You can see that in the pretumoral cells, it's um, getting high starting from LP. It's uh, also high naturally in basal cells, but it's not the same genes that are involved. Uh, that's important. Indeed, you see that it's not as high as well. Uh, so I want to show you a validation is what we've tried to do is uh, we have done the markers of EMT and we have indeed found found signs of epithelial cells that are starting to activate vimentin, for example, in these tissues. But I think that the most striking proof of EMT activation in these cells is that we have tried to predict what could be the transcription factor that's driving, in general, not only EMT, but driving the pretumoral gene expression gene set. And bingo, when you do that with uh, this tool, for example, that's not influenced uh, by the level of expression of transcription factors, you can see that the top players that you predict to be a general candidate transcription factor for the pretumoral state are mostly EMT-associated TF. So for us, it means several things. is that perhaps EMT is the main mechanism that's happening at the pretumoral state, and that all the gene signature we're seeing is potentially driven by one of these uh, guys. And we have confirmed that uh, in vivo, uh, taking all the different uh, EMT transcription factors that we could put our hands on. And we have identified and potentially the one that could be driving uh, early activation of EMT uh, prior to tumor formation or as tumor is forming could be the snail um, transcription factor that we can detect in glands as they are transforming. And the twist was a nice control because twist one is known to get activated further down the line in tumors themselves for metastasis, for example. And we do find twist activation, but it happens later on. So again, pushing the fact that these single cell transcriptomics are nice for sure, but if you push it and you validate them and you think about how you're trying to understand these dynamics, it could give you a lot of ways to, to push hypothesis, right? And we're trying to now mechanistically validate how snail could be a driver of, of this transformation. So I'll finish on that, um, just to, to tell you that the, the progress we've made on single nuclei RNA-seq in humans was instrumental um, to push the level of the data to a level that now we can detect certain mechanism of, I would say, phenotype, loss of phenotype or tissue uh, loss of tissue homeostasis in some samples and most of our BRCA1 samples. And also thinking of looking at juxta tumoral was instrumental because we thought we were already at the right time. And combining that with this mouse model, now we propose a system where indeed it all starts from the accumulation of CNVs uh, in a BRCA1 predisposed patient or mice. And then what is needed to, to form a tumor, we propose that one part of the solution could be uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition that's been shown in other contexts to, to override senescence uh, and override this kind of mechanism for cells to go around this stress or, or, or CNV stress. And so we're trying to, to work on this also in humans to see whether that could make any sense um, in early uh, tumor formation. So I think I've already done a bit of conclusion. Uh, we're also now studying quite a lot of uh, patient uh, trial. Uh, and now moving for sure uh, back to epigenome on this uh, situation to understand what's the regulation of the expression program we're seeing, but we really wanted to have first uh, an appreciation at the transcriptomic level. If you're interested in what I told you about the, the genome, the um, integration-free embeddings, you can have a look at our publication in Nature Communication on the Maya and also on the GitHub uh, that we have done as a collaboration with One Biosciences. And we also have means to look at epigenomic data, whether cut and tag, cheap seek, single cell wise and attack. You can work for any of them. You can have a look at our, our Chrome step, um, Chromescape tool. These are the people who've done the work, maybe not the latest picture, uh, but what you've seen was achieved uh, by Melissa here, Camille and, and Marthe um, in principle. And also a lot of development from Adeline here on the, on the technology side. Um, and our collaborators uh, and our funders here. Um, 
but uh, make this happen. And thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Sadine, for this wonderful talk and uh, the exciting data you showed, uh, many aspects from mouse work to patient work and also bringing it to the functional level. This is very impressive, thank you so much. So everyone, please ask your questions by either raising your hand and unmuting yourself or also by typing your question into the chat. Um, I saw that there's already one question in the chat um, asking, saying that you mentioned that epigenetics and transcriptomics most often negatively correlated. Can you elaborate on this? If that is yeah. the case, how do we then integrate the two omic types in risk predictions? So, you know, uh, I may not have been that clear on this. I'm not saying in most general cases for most uh, features or genes, they do actively uh, positively correlate. I'm not saying that, but I think that our interest lies in the cases where they do not correlate. And I'm just saying that if you use integration tool, which is fine uh, to integrate different types of omics, sometimes you lose part of these cases, right? So we just need to, to find methods and to think about how we can also focus, first do the integration, seeing what's correlated and that's nice, but also don't forget to study all the loci where you see either decorrelation in time when you have a time series or a decorrelation in one time point to understand how that relates to the regulation of this loci. Does it make any sense? But this is not the majority. But you have negative correlation for repressive marks for sure. But I'm saying that in most cases, it does make sense. I'm not saying the other way. Okay, cool. Thanks for clarifying. Then um, Roy raised his hand. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Itamar. I don't know why it says uh, Roy, but uh, I wanted to ask, uh, don't you see uh, clusters of myoepithelial cells in the, uh, in the epithel? So we, I think they're mixed with the basal uh, also cells. Uh, so yeah, we don't see a major difference between the two. Uh, and in most cases, we don't focus mainly on this, uh, but maybe in the human, we're gonna study a bit more also with spatial approaches, those uh, mu epithelial cells, that's for sure. But, but at the point we, we didn't pay much attention to them yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sandra had a question as well. Yeah, hi, thank you. I was wondering if you have any, observed any differences between the mechanisms of escape to Zeloda versus Zeloda uh, in, in combo with the SKG4. Do, do cells are, are yeah. cells more? Uh, so that's a very good question. Uh, we, we didn't take much of the time to study how they escape the double treatment. Uh, we should, uh, we, we have some sample maybe frozen or we could do the experiments again. I think uh, the best situation would be how KDM6A KOs, genetic KOs to make it because they will be cleaner, right? We're sure that they got the treatment. We're sure that they don't have the enzyme mm -hmm. and whether they can make it. Uh, but I think your point is very valid. What do they do that, then, right? Um, but yeah, we, they're more, more aggressive or, or, or things like that. Yeah, we don't know. But uh, I, I think on the KO, it would be really worth it to see how they escape. Uh, if, okay. if some do escape because some do, how do they do it, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And I have a question about the um, nice data on the pre-tumoral cells. Um, we use, you nicely showed that uh, when you are accumulating more CNVs that you then get also the epigenetic changes and the transcriptomic changes along with those um, then uh, indicating that EMT could play a role and different transcription factors are deregulated. Have you checked if the uh, CNVs in those cells are actually um, including those regulators that you see changed on expression level? So did you link then the genomics with the epigenetics and transcriptomics? So yeah, that's a pretty good question. I don't think we have so far the level of resolution uh, within first CNV to do that. We would need to do uh, more whole genome sequencing of a bunch of pretty small cells to have the depth to, to see that. What I can tell you is that they don't always accumulate the same, um, the same events. So they always doing EMT, but they don't have necessarily the same uh, CNVs at the level of resolution we can say. So I would bet that it's not genetically driven. Plus what I didn't show is that um, 
we believe this population is multi-clonal um, for different reasons. And um, yeah, so we rather think this EMT could be uh, non-genetic driven, but it, it could be worth it to do a whole genome just to check that there might not be focal uh, alteration of regulators. Recurrent. Yeah, it could also be something upstream, really, that is then yeah. coming again and that you might be missing. Yes. Fully agreed on that. Yeah, we need to get higher resolution. What we're trying to do now is map these pretumor cells. We, we have labeled them with a mouse with GFP so we can catch them more easily and, and really map them with higher definition Yeah, at the molecular level. Yeah. We might and another question. Yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Another question I had was regarding the, the epi drugs uh, you showed um, in your first story and the nice effects you saw in the in the mouse model. Um, where do you feel that the uh, field needs to be going um, to really use um, epigenetic drugs in the context of cancer treatment? I think uh, we all know that the, even the, the, the one that we use and the different epigenetic drugs are very... Um, are too genome wide. I mean, uh, we, we have this. So something we're thinking about is they are too genome wide and they don't only target uh, their enzyme of interest because they have many other targets. So one way is to be, is now to, to be sure about how they could be more specific. Uh, so this, I think, with all the, the areas of protax and so on, I think there's a new era that's opening up for epigenetic compounds to be made in a v3.0 maybe <laughs> a way that could be more efficient than how we designed them previously that's the first thing and then i think that uh, narrowing down the window of intervention is really giving them uh, a very low uh, doses on a very uh, closed up window might be a solution to prevent some too many and, and this we can guess maybe from the data by modeling um, the plasticity mm -hmm. of this where, where it's the maximum uh, where it's the climax of plasticity, this is where we should give the drug. And it, I think it doesn't happen all the time. Right. Yeah, because yeah, that would be a good strategy to minimize the side effects and mm -hmm. really just mm -hmm. hit it at the right time. Right? Yeah, that would be my bet. So this and maybe a better design with all the solutions that we have right now may be a, a good way to go, right? Yeah, and also a more gene-specific approach rather than like a... This is how... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm more thinking that this might be a uh, generation uh, 4.0, but I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, it will take some time, but yeah. yes. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Did I miss something? No, there's no further question in the chat. Oh, no, there's one coming. Um, asking or saying diseases like cancer are very complex. Do you think single cell will explain risk? No. So... I don't think we will, um, single cell is about zooming on a low number of cases and not having a lot of information on a lot of cases. So this being said, I think discovering the risk and other factor risk is better achieved by having a, a huge number of patients to discover rare stuff or whatever. So I, I don't think so, but um, if we, we can have single cell could be used as we've shown there, maybe to monitor um, this risk and, and its manifestation and its earliest manifestation. That, that's rather what I would think. But I'm not sure we'll find a reason uh, behind this right away. Mm. We need to yeah. put hundreds of thousands of cells and, you know. Yeah, so as, as you mentioned, but, it's, yeah. it's probably a combination you need at the end also of different techniques to really uh, yeah. profile risks. So, so we might get closer to the answer, but I'm not sure we'll get to the end point with single cell necessarily. Yeah. All right, I don't see anyone else raising their hand. Um, if these, if no one else has a question, then let's thank Celine again for this wonderful talk. Um, it was a pleasure to have you here today. Um, thank you, yeah. Um, everyone have a great day and see you soon then in our October meeting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, see you soon. Bye guys. Thanks. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.